Hey, it's Matt. Welcome to Unbearable 73. Unfortunately, unfortunately, depending on your point of view, it's time to review Amazon's Rings of Prime again. Uh, again. Up today is Season 1, Episode 2. Now, this episode is purely a review. I'll be critical of the lore only as it is self-consistent with Rings of Power's own internal story. Since Amazon doesn't have the rights to all the lore, they had to make stuff up. I will do a separate video breaking down at least some of the lore deviations for each episode with related to the, the entirety of Tolkien's Legendarium. Okay? That'll, be real, that'll be posted at the same time as this video, so you can watch this. If you're curious, you can watch the other one and see what, what, what Amazon changed or didn't write to or whatever. Okay? So first, let's talk about production. Uh, many of the same issues with production exist with the second episode as for the first. I'm going to highlight a couple of the episode-specific examples for the good and the bad. Okay, uh, As I said... First, we'll talk about visuals first. As I said, the background scenery and some of the set pieces like the Mines of Moria look good. Um, the cinematographers and the people who did the sets, whether CGI or physical, they did mostly good work. I mean, when they saw those zooming shots over landscapes or when they did the map transitions or when they showed like Moria, for example, those guys put their hearts into it. Whether you agree with what they look like or not is one thing, but that the background stuff looked decent, okay? And again, that's a shame because of how bad this series is shaping up to be. So, now on the direction. Uh, once again, J.A. Bayona directed this, and once again, he presented us with a highly flawed product. The non-contextual opposition continued, though it wasn't as bad as the first episode. For example, when Galadriel and Halbrand are on their little, their little rifle app, they randomly start a line of conversations designed to a real backstory. My point is, we just we just see a break into that. There's no story or previous existing dialogue that establishes why they might be talking about that. Like, why would these two people who are on danger of drowning, almost drowned, sea monster going, would randomly start talking about the kingdom they came from and whether one's a traitor or not? You know, that's got to be led into as part, to seem natural. It's got to be led to as part of a conversation that of something that's already occurring. Another example happened earlier in the episode when we see Elrond talking to Celebrimbor in what appears to be Celebrimbor's office. We immediately have a camera focus on Fionor's hammer, and then we get an exposition dump on Fionor, Morgoth, and Silmarils. Are we to believe that Elrond, who in this story is at least hundreds of years old, has never met one of the lords of the Noldor or Celebrimbor? Elrond is Gil-galad's herald. Basically, it means he's supposed to be one of Gil-galad's court inner people. Even if they had instead had instead had them talking about the project and then walking by Elrond because they said, like, you know, as many times they work together, I've never seen Fionor's hammer. That would have been at least a somewhat contextual way to drop it. You know, so let's go on to the acting now. It should go out saying that the actors, for the most part, have not been given much to work with. On the positive side, regardless of what you think of the actress and, and her world comments, the best scene, which was somewhat enjoyable, is dinner at, the dinner at Disa scene. Mrs. Numvote Numv and Mr. Arthur, who played Disa and Jordan IV, respectively, do have some on-screen chemistry together. The content of the scene itself is kind of stupid, um, you know, which I'll talk about later. The sort of interplay between those two, and and the way they acted it out. I mean, they're trying; those two are trying to do their best, giving them sure that they were given. Okay? Um, of course, we get the insipid performances of B Benjamin Walker, who plays Gil Gallad, Robert Aramayo, who plays Elrond, and Charles Edwards, who plays Gil Cal Calibrimbor, whenever they're on screen. These three characters, only considering the context of the show and the fact that it's a prequel to The Lord of the Rings, are supposed to be leaders and warriors. We know that from what was said in The Lord of the Rings. In other words, they might not have the rights to other stuff, but by, by, by definition of what they had, they're supposed to be in compliance with The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Okay? They, they, these, these three actors, they never have the body posture of warriors, and they look rather indecisive whenever they're making decisions. We're supposed to believe that Aaron, De uh, another one. We're supposed to believe that Aaron De and Bronwyn have a deep and abiding love that transcends a, the normal lack of attraction that men and elves have for one another. The dialogue's problematic, but the body language is worse. It's probably because Ismael Cruz Cordova, who plays Aaron De, only seems to have one facial expression the entirety of the two episodes. Okay? Unfortunately, we have to talk about the writing, and that's where the host of the problems uh, originate. Okay, the same problems present in the first episode are present here to, to varying degrees. The characters continue to engage in non-contextual ex expositional dialogue. That means that characters have seen solely to explain what's going on and to, and to reveal a background material to the audience. An example, meaning th this is something the characters already know and would not normally talk about unless it comes out in the context of something else, but they just randomly start talking about it. It would be like you 
you I would like to say me and you who are listening to this deciding to talk about um you know uh how many senators there are in the U.S. randomly just but not in a way that's talk about who we elect to say um you know well there are fifty senators or two like, like explaining it to each other as if we had never heard this before you know or some other like contextual thing like that you know uh. Now, here's an example. I mentioned the scene where Keller Brimbor and Elrond talk about Fenor, Morgoth, and the Summerals. That scene has almost no context other than that exposition. It's compounded by the idea that these two elves denote the leadership who would have been involved in that leadership together for hundreds of years seemingly have never met or one another. Imagine instead if that scene played out this way. We fade in with them discussing Keller Brimbor planning on building that immense forge. Elrond says something like, that will require powerful resources and significant labor. Keller Brimbor replied by saying he knows he was employing his grandfather Fenor's hammer. That could have led into the details about Fenor and Morgoth and the Simerals, turning turning this non-contextual exposition that was in there into a story-based lore reveal. Would have, you know, would have felt natural. Would have brought you into the story. Uh, you know, another issue is the whole Harfeet subplot. Literally, nothing is happening in most of their scenes, with the exception of the one with the warg in the first episode and the, and the one with the meteor man. All we're getting is scenes with characters that have no effect on the story. They can literally edit them all out, and you wouldn't it wouldn't no difference. Had the first scene with the Harfords being the rival of Meteor Man, and then we have the next scene being Stadok teaching Neil Harfi in a school setting, maybe like like he's sitting on a, a bench and surrounding and explaining how the Harford way of life would have to migrate to protect themselves, and 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 using his book to show them pictures of, of the dangers and whatever. That would have put that book in context. That would have put what he's doing in context. But no, we just get people honestly dumping information at the audience for no logical reason. I get the impression that the writers on this are just working from a timeline of events that someone outlined and said we have to have these things happen at the, 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 in this order in the episodes. And they're just depicting the character in scene location and not placing those scenes in any context, not having anything occurring in them other than the character there to dump information at you or to have a fight. Uh, I have a lot more to comment on the writing, but given that it's likely an only issue, I'm going to move on. because you know. Now, the special effects, the costume, the scenery, I alluded to this a little bit before. Um, the people working in the background continue the best thing coming out of this show. But the people doing costumes seem to be using recycled materials reclaimed from motel deconstruction. Now, on the sound and audio, people have said that the score is good. My problem with that is that the rest of it's so bad that the score doesn't do what it's supposed to do, which is draw me in and aid in the immersion. So the score is not sticking with me because I don't. The story is not drawing me in. Plot review. So, uh, plot. Aha! It did not save this episode. Uh, bonus point: if Someone gets that little badly sung reference there. Um, so far, we have had two hours and 20 minutes of this show. The opening 17 or so minutes was exposition, for the most part, by Xena Ladriel, providing the whole history of the wars of the First Age and why the elves returned to Middle-earth. Fast forward to, the, to this episode, then we get Elrond and Keller Brimble providing the actual reason in the material that Amazon actually licensed, in what they licensed, for why the old elves returned to Middle-earth in the First Age. If you're going to change it, which Galadriel did, why would you then waste screen time talking about Fenor and the Simrils and the horrors that emerged? You could, you could have therefore cut that whole two-minute, three-minute conversation out. That makes no writing sense why you would do both. Also, how logical from a pure, pure point of view is that Keller Brimmer and Elrond, who have been involved in the Elven leadership for 100 years, somehow don't know one another. Um, staying on Elrond, elves are immortal, and Elrond is hundreds of years old, having been born in the first age. We know that because it has to be in contrast with Lord of the Rings, and Elrond says in the Lord of the Rings he, was, he experienced origins of the first age. Okay? Bear with right? So, dwarves live for several hundred years. Why would you write that Elrond not visiting during the fourth for twenty years to be an issue? Twenty years is like a blink of an eye to Elrond. It would be like a week might be to Doran, to a human for Doran, Doran the fourth. Uh, uh, turning to the plots or lack there for the Harfeet, the only two things that seem that, that they seem to that, as their plots are Meteor Man and them need to migrate soon. Yeah, yeah, Meteor Man's only really interacted with Nori, which means most of the other scenes should have at least be dealt with the migration plot. They don't. They're just Harford characterization scenes. Okay, For Gladriel, this episode basically had her swimming a lot. Then she met a bunch of characters who were killed off minutes later, and then she and Halbert made it a safety. Plus that exposition I talked about before. Right? Something could have been cut out there, like all those extra people who, you know. Uh, finally, on the human plot, well, the one we've seen so far, at least that one's progressed somewhat. But if they have to cut out, they, they could have cut out extra material, um, you know, and then maybe... Um, bump more of the human story or something. Anyway, finally, um, I think that's what I'm going to stop here for this episode. I don't want to microanalyze each one and bore people out of their minds. I think that would uh, bore people as I just, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Like, I don't know why. 
uh, at least more than the show already is. And that's the main issue. The show is boring and unimmersive, regardless of the issues with the lore and the woke. I will give this episode a 1 out of 10, almost solely for the background work and that one scene with Disa Duran and Elrond, which was mildly entertaining. Could have been a lot better if the dialogue was better or if the context of Elrond being there was better. Right? Which really, that should have been Celebrimbor, by the way. Celebrimbor is the one who befriended the dwarves. That should have just been him at that dinner. <sighs> Comment down below if you have any questions for me about this video. Please share your thoughts. Share this video if you enjoyed it. Like if you like. Dislike if you dislike. Subscribe if you want to hear more from me. My name is Matt. This has been Unbearable73. Have a nice day and I am out of here.